Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next session of AAC in the Cloud. We're excited to have you here for this presentation. Uh, this presentation will be done by Kristen Ellis, and her topic is incorporating comprehensive literacy instruction into AAC intervention. We'll turn things over to her. Thank you, Melissa. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you to everyone that is joining us for incorporating comprehensive literacy instruction into intervention. Um, I hope that that's the session that you intended to be at, because if so, you're in the right place. Um, if not, we hope that you'll just stay and join us anyway. Um, and of course, my name is Kristen Ellis, and I'm your presenter today. Um, just some disclosures before we get started. Um, financial, I'm a full-time speech language pathologist and augmentative and alternative communication specialist with Behavioral Health Associates. Um, I'm the owner of Time to Talk Therapy Services, LLC, which is my private practice, um, which will be talking about some of the programs I specifically run at my clinic. So I wanted to mention that. Um, and I am the organizer and developer of the Everyone Deserves a Voice AAC Summer Camp, which you'll be seeing um, some videos and some pictures from um, later on in the presentation. Um, and I'm financial, I'm a member of um, ASHA, um, an affiliate of SIG-12, a member of USAC, and a member of ISAC. So a little bit about me. I know that I always um, like when I go to presentations and the presenters share a little bit about themselves, um, but I received my bachelor's and my master's degrees from East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania. Um, I stayed there for all six years. Um, and I've worked in a variety of different settings. So I've worked in a bunch of different schools, including public, charter, and approved private schools for varying diagnoses, including autism spectrum disorder, um, visually impaired, um, social emotional disturbances. Um, so pretty much if you can name it, I've probably worked in it at some point in time. When I was first getting started in my career, I did a lot of covering of maternity leaves, which is how I caught in and out of a bunch of different um, settings. Um, I've worked in a variety of healthcare settings, including outpatient clinics, skilled nursing facilities, and home health. Um, and I figured, why not? Out of the middle of the pandemic, I decided to start my own private practice out of a need for services in the area. Um, and families not feeling comfortable to go to clinics and travel to clinics. So I was doing traveling therapy to their homes um, starting in July of 2020. Um, some of the learning objectives for today, um, just to identify um, when to use conventional literacy instruction um, versus comprehensive emergent literacy in approach. Um, to recognize um, our role as the speech language pathologist, specifically in regard to working with these students with complex communication needs. Um, what we can do during our intervention to strengthen and reinforce emergent literacy and how do we select, and this is always the question that I have, how do we select appropriate activities that can be easily incorporated into our AAC intervention? So, one of the biggest topics in literacy and AAC is this book, which um, Comprehensive Literacy for All, you know, teaching students with significant disabilities to read and write by Karen Erickson and David Copenhaver. Um, it's amazing if you have not um, been able to get your hands on a copy or read it yet. I highly recommend um, and I've been doing, Facebook actually has a group where you can basically independent study this book. Um, and it gives you the ability to talk with other professionals and parents as to what their takeaways are from like each individual chapter. Um, and they'll ask you um, critical thinking questions about each chapter, which is awesome um, to connect with other people as well and see what they're taking away from it versus what you're taking away from it. Um, I have not finished it um, yet, but I will say that some of the early content you're going to see is taken from um, this book and kind of has just sparked this presentation today um, and identifying it as an area of need in, in our field. Um, so first of all, we have to talk a little bit about what emergent literacy is, because I know when I was first getting started in this, I was like, well, what exactly 
is that and what encompasses that, um, you know, and it encompasses the knowledge, the skills and the attitudes that a child develops in relation to reading and writing throughout the early childhood period. Um, and, and the skills that are included in there are oral language, which is both speaking and listening, understanding that print carries meaning, basic alphabet knowledge, early phonological awareness skills all kind of fall within this emergent literacy package. Um, and these skills begin at birth. Even it, when you read the, the book, they talk about how this exposure even begins in utero, right? For those mothers who are reading to their children while they're pregnant. Um, and it continues through the preschool years um, and, and usually starts to taper off at the onset of conventional reading and writing instruction, which is usually upon entering school um, and going into a public, a charter, um, a, a cyber, school um, and entering into that kindergarten environment is when that conventional reading tends to take over. But emergent literacy skills are highly dependent on the nature, the frequency, the accessibility, um, and interpre interpretability of experiences with print. Um, so, you know, we've noticed in our field as speech language pathologists that maybe there are kids that we, we tend to say, well, they're their skills are underdeveloped because of a lack of exposure. And it's the same thing for emergent literacy skills. If we have that lack of exposure, um, it's more than likely we're going to be delayed or behind in those areas. Um, so I talked a little bit before about, you know, the comprehensive emergent literacy approach, but I also mentioned the conventional literacy instruction as well. Um, and when a child is going into school, we have to figure out which way we're going to go. And in order to do that, there's a series of yes, no questions that are, are asked um, about the student in order to determine, are we going an emergent route or a conventional literacy route? Um, and those questions are as follows. Does the student identify most of the letters of the alphabet most of the time? Is the student interested and engaged during shared reading? Does the student have a means of communication and interaction? Does the student understand that print has meaning? And those are all directly taken from that, that book that I mentioned earlier. So if we think about this with our students, what does this mean? Well, if we fall into the category of we're getting four yes responses, it would indicate that through all of those questions that are mentioned prior, it would indicate that a student is likely to be successful with the introduction of conventional literacy instruction. One or more negative answers, as in like they can't do it, um, or maybe you're not sure if they can do it, um, would indicate the need for a comprehensive emergent literacy instruction approach. And why do we use the word comprehensive? And why do we take a comprehensive approach when we're um, teaching anyone, any skill, typically, especially in speech and language, but especially in the literacy world. Um, you know, we're turning to a comprehensive approach because of the enormous variety in our learners, um, you know, specifically with those with significant disabilities, um, because the emergent literacy knowledge and understanding have foundational importance to later conventional literacy learning. And so we're going to come at them from all angles and we're going to teach them every way we can um, to get them to get a good foundation for those conventional literacy skills when and if that time comes for them. You know, simply put, emergent literacy, when provided with further experience and instruction, it's going to lead to the more important ends of independent communication, reading and writing capabilities and to the choices, opportunities, and increased control that those skills represent for people with significant disabilities. I know sometimes in the, in the realm of augmentative and alternative communication, we say that if a child can type or they can write, that the world is theirs. Um, but being able to do that, they need to have these emergent literacy skills, a firm foundation before we're moving forward.
and getting them to that point of they can say anything they want to say because they can write it or they can type it. So what is the role of the SLP in, in all of this? Um, and according to ASHA, the speech language pathologists, the SLPs have a key role in promoting the emergent literacy skills of all children, and especially those with known or suspected literacy related learning difficulties, um, which are individuals with complex communication needs most definitely fall in that realm of literacy related learning difficulties. SLPs may help to prevent such problems, identify children at risk for reading and writing difficulties, and provide intervention to remediate literacy-related difficulties. Prevention efforts um, involve working in collaboration with families, caregivers, and teachers to ensure that young children have high quality and ample opportunities to participate in emergent literacy activities. And this is both at home, in daycare, in preschool environments, um, so it's happening everywhere. Um, and we can also help older children or those with developmental delays who have missed such opportunities, um, which can be very common um, in our field that especially those individuals with complex communication needs that they either have that lack of exposure or no one, no one simply has tried um, because it's been written off that they can't do it. So emergent literacy and its relation to our complex communication needs um, individuals. You know, as I mentioned a little bit before, literacy is often an overlooked area of instruction for AAC users, specifically for those with more complex communication needs. Many older students and even adults with these significant disabilities are still emerging in their understandings of literacy due to the limited learning opportunities that they had earlier in their lives. Um, they're often viewed as being incapable of learning and engaging in emergent literacy activities. However, it's a very common misconception. And, and I myself, when I was first starting out in this field, I'm guilty of those same thoughts of thinking, you know, well, maybe they can't, but I've been proven wrong time and time again. Um, and now I kind of make it my mission to prove everybody else wrong that these kiddos can and they will do it. Um, in their own way, in their own time. Um, and these individuals, they have to be engaged in and they have to be exposed to using reading and writing in real world contexts from very early on, just like they're typically developing peers. And if you think for any of you that maybe have children or young nieces, nephews, other family members that are you know, in any school system currently, think about how much time they have ELA that English language time. Um, in many schools, it's about 90 minutes a day. And we know already that our individuals learn typically at a slower rate and need even more repetition. So they need even more time and exposure to these emergent literacy activities to get that good foundation to become those independent communicators in the future through typing or writing. So the big thing that everyone you know, wants to know is where do we start? How do we start? I always like to tell people collaboration is the key to succeeding um, when it comes to this emergent literacy. I'm constantly, as a school-based clinician in an approved private school, I'm constantly, constantly communicating with my teachers, their paras, and even other therapists, um, occupational therapists and physical therapists. Um, my program is for students with mental health issues. So there are also educational therapists, psychologists and other professionals on site. Um, so I may tap their brains as well for, you know, what have they found that's working? What kind of activities are they doing that's working with their students? And then I find a way to incorporate it into my literacy based activities. You know, am I going to be pulling from their sight words? I might walk in and ask their classroom teacher, what are the sight words they're working on? Um, what level of sight words are they on? Because if I'm choosing a different level of sight words than what they are ready to do, that's not going to be helpful either. 
um, if I'm too far ahead. But also if I'm too, too far below, they're not challenged enough either um, in wanting to learn these skills. Um, and it, my occupational therapist and my physical therapist are great for kind of adapting activities as to what do your kids enjoy during your therapy sessions? You know, do they enjoy the scooter boards? Do they enjoy um, bear crawling on the, on the ground? And, you know, what can I do to get them moving? And, you know, the more movement that we have typically in an activity and the more engaging and the more fun it is, the more likely we are to remember what's being presented. You know, and I'm not necessarily reinventing the wheel either. You know, what is already being utilized in the classroom um, and those other therapy sessions to encourage the carryover of skills? Is there a book they're using that, you know, they're doing throughout the next month that, oh, well, let me pull that book and let me pull out their sight words. And we can work on that by attributing it to that book they're already working on. Um, something else my teachers do is they'll give me vocabulary words if they're doing um, a particular book, like a, a book study or something like that. And we'll, we'll incorporate those into our session as well as we're kind of moving through the activities that we're doing. Um, I tend to do a lot of shared reading and at my um, summer camp that I run at my clinic at my private practice, um, several of the next slides are attributed to the activities that we've been doing in our summer camp. Um, and you can see all of our kiddos and there's at least one adult either next to them or nearby them that has you know, their copy of the book they have their AAC devices out um, and adults and helpers are modeling the vocabulary that we're doing. Um, you know, sometimes that becomes difficult, right? That's the modeling question of how many words and what words are we going to model? Um, and you kind of have to gauge your learners. You have to gauge, you know, starting with one is okay. And then you can always increase from there. Um, I know in our camp, we're focusing on two words a day um, and we change it every day um, and in their individual sessions that they have with me or even outside of camp, then we do some carryover activities in those sessions. To show that. Um, but the shared reading can take lots of different um, shapes. This could be a shared reading with a book that's already being talked about in the classroom. This could be um, just a book you're doing with all of your speech and language kids, or maybe with an entire classroom, if you do group lessons, um, that you're just kind of incorporating. But just keep in mind what I had mentioned earlier about, you know, sometimes our kiddos with complex communication needs, and even adults, they just need that extra, extra exposure to things. So where a typical classroom might read that one book, and that's all for that day, what we've been doing in our camp is we're reading the book every single day um, for a whole week. And then we're doing activities that accompany it. Um, so they're getting constant exposure to those target vocabulary words during the shared reading. Um, and in this bottom right-hand picture, you can see the, the special education teacher reading with a larger copy of the book where all of the our campers have the smaller version of the book. You know, and people ask me, how do we make them know which words we're trying to target? And you can do that a whole bunch of different ways. Um, one of the ways that we decided to with our book that we've been using this week with our Bear's New Friend is we uh, captured all of their images and, and the pathway, and then we put those into that page, and then we boxed around the word. So we're drawing their attention from the way it looks on their system to the way it looks in print without the icons. Um, so they're starting to attribute like, oh, this who, and that's what it looks like. It's a W, H, and O. Um, and we make it adaptable for everybody. 
So our picture on the right-hand side is a young girl who uses head tracking. Um, and you can see she has the same layout. You know, she's using that touch chat um, symbol set on a 42 layout. So her images just are matching to her layout. So her word out is under the extra words and it's not on the home page. So it's a little bit different than the 60 layout that several of our campers have. And her book also has some adapted, um, well, what it really is, is contact lens holders that have been glued to it so she can independently move the page. Because if she's engaged in it rather than mom doing everything and she is taking the ownership of turning the pages, she is going to be getting more out of it because she's physically involved in the shared reading activity. Something else that we focus a lot on in our camp is sight words and you know how do we go about sight words? You know, first of all, we have to determine that level, right? Which level of sight words are they at? And then picking from there some, not all of them. You know, maybe starting with five. This little guy started with five. Um, and the attention span was very, very short. So how are we going to get him to sit and be active at the same time because he likes to be active and still get exposure to those sight words? Well, we're going to pull out some kinetic sand and we're going to laminate all the sight words and we're going to shove them in between the sand. And you can see him in the far right that he's pulling it out of the kinetic sand. And then what we were doing as we're pulling that out is we were, I was modeling that word on his um, Snap Plus Core that he has on an iPad. And after the first couple of times, he was then modeling that, he was doing it after me. So I would model the word. And then towards the end of this activity, he was able to, when the word was coming out, he was able to locate it. Sometimes he needed a little bit of assistance, but from a child that wouldn't sit and do anything with sight words at all to now you've adapted it to be more hands-on, more tactile, engaging, now sat for a good 15 minutes and went through the sight words about five times. So he got that constant exposure to those words. Um, and he even at one point pointed out using his device that there was a word that was targeted in the shared reading book that was not amongst the sight words. Um, which was a really exciting feat, I think, for this little guy who who does kind of struggle sitting and attending at this current state right now. Kristen, yes. there's a question real quick. Someone sure. wants to know, is there a tool that you recommend to identify a student's reading level? Um, so the the tool I use most frequently is their classroom teacher um, as to what they're exposing them to because whatever they're exposing them to i will then um go after the same thing um it, it's going to depend on kind of your school district and your placement as to where you are you know some schools use the dolch sight words some use the fry sight word lists um but you can also kind of search it based on grade level um on a lot of internet searches just to make sure what i'm being given um, my teachers in the past was kind of aligning with what where I should be. Um, so I do that. Perfect. Something Thank else you. I tend to work on with um, my kiddos that are moving along and they're starting to show that they are really emerging in their spelling skills and they're showing an interest in their keyboard even, is I start to do a lot of modeling and teaching of spelling um, and how we sound that out. And I show them that phonics folder that exists on a lot of the AAC devices, which they think is really interesting. Um, and one of the ones I tend to start with are, is the at word family. Because if you think about you know, the school curriculum and some of the first word families that are introduced, they're the ones with the short vowels, which is that far left-hand column of the word families. Um, so I usually start with at. Um, a lot of my kiddos tend to really like animals too. So it's helpful because cat and rat are in there um, to make that fun. So I'm going to show you um, a video of a guy that I've been working with for two years now. 
And this video was taken about a year into him having his Nova chat. And his name is William. He is now 10. And we're working on word families. Can we spell it first? Buh. 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 William, what comes next? Ah. A. C. Good job. Bat. You spelled bat. You spelled. What did you spell? Can you find it? Where is it? So you could see, um, I know when I was first shooting the video, it was difficult to see kind of what he was looking at, but what he had was hard that I laminated and then I used a razor blade to cut the slits in it and then the sliding of the consonants to go with the at family. Um, so he was able to slide it for that tactile um, input of and control. He likes this kiddo does like to have control and that gives him control of the activity that he can move the consonants the way he wants them to go. Um, another thing I said about kind of using your resources too, this is when I was doing home visits um, amidst the pandemic still and you know he wanted to do speech outside. So we were outside on his patio, sitting outside doing that activity. I took the literacy activity to him. Um, you know, and again, you, you're going to sit there and you're going to ask yourself, what are they learning in their classroom already? Or what are peer, typically developing peers learning? You know, sometimes this takes a matter of, you know, talking with the staff that you work with, your kindergarten teachers or your first grade teachers. Um, I've even gone into classrooms and observed what's going on in there. What types of literacy activities is the teacher doing or not doing for that matter? And if that's the case, what can I be doing to expose them to that? And I realized after I put this together, I probably should have done the working on the letters first, because remember one of the first, one of the questions in that set of four questions was, are they recognizing and identifying the letters of the alphabet at least most of the time? So sometimes that's even where we're starting with some of our AAC users is even if it's briefly making sure they kind of recognize those letters in print to when you're saying them. Um, and again, we can see a 13 year old versus a five year old still enjoying a letter based activity that has tactile manipulation. This is that play foam um, that are like the little beads. Um, so not quite as messy as slime and it, not as sticky either. Um, but you can see the difference in my, my five-year-old is he's like really looking and he's really engaged at that letter pattern. Where my 13-year-old has his Lamp Words for Life there open to his phonics page. So we're doing the same activity, but we're leveling it differently based on the need of the child. So we talked about some sight words and you saw my little friend earlier that, you know, has a history of not having much attention span and he was working on some sight words. Well, once we're kind of working on sight words, I tend to also almost simultaneously introduce sight word readers. Um, and before I found this wonderful website called teachingmama.org, I was kind of spending hours upon hours on Teachers Pay Teachers trying to find things that would work for my kiddos. Um, and we all love free. Um, and you have black and white and color option, which is always nice because we know so many times that we don't have the availability of color printing or it's limited. Um, it gives you the ability to 
have some more activity of like coloring and giving that involvement as you're doing the pages. Um, these next two videos are from kiddos from my approved private school that are on my caseload. Um, one um, is verbal as well. Um, when he first was introduced to his AAC device, he was nonverbal, only making some speech sounds and not consistently. But after um, a year of school exposure and speech and language therapy, you're gonna see how Mason has really progressed in his ability to now read. So let me get Mason for us. And you'll, the books that are in the videos are from the teachingmama.org. So I definitely wanted to throw a shout out to them for their amazing resources. Um, I, see. the, mm. giraffe. Good yeah. job. Let's make our whole sentence. I, I you do. I, I, see, giraffe. Period. Period. Where's your, I, see giraffe. I, I see, the, mm. giraffe. Good yeah. job. Let's make our whole sentence. I, I, you do, I, I, see, giraffe, giraffe, period, period, where's your, I see giraffe, I, I see, the, mm. giraffe. And you can see how Mason at the end, I was drawing his attention to the punctuation. And that was at the recommendation of the teacher because they were starting to draw his attention to the punctuation on the end, uh, which I know sometimes when we're getting kids set up with AAC devices, the punctuation and the grammar is not necessarily the first things that we're looking at. So keep in mind that is about a nine months to a year after first being introduced to the AAC device that we were then starting to introduce some more grammar to him. Our next little guy is. Lucius, who I only got to meet Lucius the beginning of this past school year. He came to us in October from his homeschool district. Um, when Lucius came to me, he was completely nonverbal. He would, his way of communication was through behavior. Um, and that looked a variety of different ways from throwing things to um, head banging to throwing himself on the ground. And this video that you're going to see was taken right before the end of school. Um, so we ended our school year June 13th. It was that last, that not the very last week, but that week before in June. And we got him, his communication device came in right after Christmas break, so January. So this is the progress from January to June. And this is Lucius. You're up. Yep, there you go. Yes. You. Stop. On. The. Bus. Yes, you can put the bus on the bus. Nice. Good job, Lucia. And you could see how Lucius was starting to independently put that period on at the end. And again, those were just sentence strips. I actually got it for final consonant deletion kid and I loved them so much that I laminated everything and I made them interchangeable. So we would make like silly sentences. So 
yes, you can put the boat on the bus. Um, and there were tons of pictures that he gets that manipulation and that control where, you know, he gets to pull it off and he gets to put something different on and it makes him more engaged in the activity and wanting to do the activity because he had some control and some say in it. And again, those, all of those readers are coming from that teachingmama.org, um, which has been my savior with all of my kiddos. So then I move in and I've been doing lots of core word activities specifically through our camp that we've been running um, this week. And, you know, our word, one of our words for this week is who. Um, and you got to see my friend William before about a year ago doing some things. And now William is at the stage where he is spelling more things um, independently. So he is spelling his name. If you give him the sounds, he is able to find all the letters and type it in. So we've been moving towards, and this is just uh, a doodle app on my iPad that I change the color and I let the kids pick the color. Again, they have some control, so they're invested. And I'm giving him the three lines and now I want him to write the word. And then we're going back and we're typing it as well. Um, so he's really getting multiple ways of exposing it. And he's watched me write the model. Um, and again, I'm picking core words based around, well, for our camp, I'm, I'm picking it based around that the books that we're doing. In the schools, I'm picking core words based on the lessons that they're doing in the classroom. Are they learning about the planets? Are they, so then I might talk about, you know, up for a little guy about how the planets are up in the sky and then even in, in the sky when it's nighttime and kind of picking words based on the lessons that they're doing. Um, so you saw a video of William a year ago, and this is William yesterday um, during camp. As you can see, his things have gotten longer and more complex. So I just want you to see how he's progressed over the last year. Who is is here? Here. Put it all together. Look. Look. Who is so you can see how much faster he's gotten from the first video was showing you with him spelling bat um, and just how he had to really think and process what he was doing. And he's just gotten so much faster at putting things together into a longer form and longer sentences. Um, you know, we've gotten away from single words and now we're building these more complex sentences for him. Um, and again, I'm giving him multiple ways to participate. So we've written his name on the paper. Um, we've cut out the, the words and now he has them in front of him and I'm giving him the choice as to, to put the words in order and then gluing them down. And then we're going back on his device and we're like, how would we make that sentence on the device? Um, questions. I know we had some questions going throughout. Um, these are, I'm just leaving some pictures from our camp and the, um, the things that we're doing. And you can see lots of letter things going on in Play-Doh and, you know, sensory things in the back or big boards up front. Um, what questions um, do you guys have for me? There is one in here that I'll read to you right now, Kristen. Um, this person says, with the emergency literacy question, number four, um, understands that print has meaning what strategies do you use for that option? Yeah, so that one is a tricky one. Um, and again, sometimes I'm relying more on the other professionals I work with because I only have a small snapshot of time that I'm with um, my speech and language kids. But sometimes what I do, if I do have the time, is I'm going to observe them in a share like a book reading activity a read aloud activity with their classroom teacher and just what they do um because a lot of times you can figure it out based on that nonverbal communication and those gestures and where their eyes are 
Um, are they looking? Are they looking at something that maybe was mentioned in the book? So something that our kids did because of the bear's new friend and it's taking place in the woods that we read it and the kids looked out the window um, with the pictures that had all of the trees and things on because you can see um, where my clinic is, there's a lot of trees in the background out the windows. Um, and even my one little guy in the picture on the right, he's actually looking out as she's reading it. So based on their behavior, I'm able to figure out that what they're hearing is kind of solidifying to them. And now they're they're seeing that in that in that print as well. Um, which is oh, I'm sorry, I went backwards. There we go. Um so it, it sometimes you're not going to figure it out on the first try. Um, I will say that. Um, and I do a lot of that wait time too. You know, if I'm doing a fill in the blank type activity, like I kind of was with William in that last video, you know, if I wait, will he do it? Um, that he understands that each of those words has a meaning and it means something else. Um, now, again, he's at a, a higher level and and has been on his AAC journey journey longer than some of our other kiddos at this camp. Um, so it's kind of meeting them where they are in their skills. That's a good question though. That's a hard one. Perfect. Thank you, Kristen. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to add those in here. Um, it looks like there are several people also interested in the comprehensive literacy for all um, book study in the Facebook group, if you have any yes. comments or things on that. Yeah. And in order to find it, you can really just put the title of the book into Facebook um, and it will, it will come up and you can just ask to join it. Um, they're a mixed one currently, but they do them, they cycle through. Um, so you can definitely jump in, in the middle of it, but you can um, wait until a new one starts as well. I just think it's nice too, because sometimes when we're leading, reading more textbook type material, um, it can be harder sometimes to follow. And it's nice to have other people to bounce ideas off of and take their interpretation of it. Yeah, I think that's true. Or, or their, their way of looking at things sometimes helps to broaden your perspective or solidify your perspective. Like, yeah, no, I don't appreciate that. Am I or, thinking the right thing? And it's different with the, with the engaging questions that they have you do, right? I talked about with our kiddos how things are committed to memory, like when they're actively engaged. And when you're in this book study, they're actively engaging you and giving you a question to answer. So you're more likely to take material away from the book because they're actively engaging you after you've read it. Exactly. It looks like we have a couple of people typing. So I'm going to give you just okay. a second. Sure. And I'm just putting up my contact information, um, my Facebook group for my private practice is there, and then my email for um, my private practice as well. If there's any questions after this, um, that you can certainly reach out to me if you have any follow up questions or need help finding the Comprehensive Literacy for All group or anything like that. Okay, it looks like one person's asking if you are willing to share your slides and yeah. I them to, okay, good. Then yeah, we'll try so and get Melissa, those up. Can I um, just send them to me? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll yep, get them I linked through our website, but I'll also post them in Slack okay. um, when they come through. Sounds good. Um, when he had a comment about that textbook, it doesn't read like a textbook to me, but it's very practical. Oh, one more question. Do you have any sight word resources for students that need larger print or if they have vision issues? Um, so I do do a lot of things through, um, like Google slides and I actually forgot to put that in here that Let me just grab my, my drive. I can show you some of the things. Actually, one of the people, one of the kiddos at our camp has CVI, cortical vision impairment. So I did need to adapt a lot of things for her. Um, and I can show you one of the adapted books that we use. So I showed you the sight word readers from teachingmama.org. And 
Here is the same animal one I was doing with Mason, but I adapted it to be CVI friendly. Now, instead of cartoon pictures, we have real animals and I've made the black background and I used romanwordbumbling.com um, to use her sight words. I picked her sight words based off what the school told me were the words they were working on. And then it's the same book, just I've used real images and put in the Roman word bubbling for her. And you can, again, if you can't um, tap a teacher for the knowledge as to what they're working on, I tend to go based on where would we start and where am I thinking? Are we thinking we know they, that they know none of their sight words, that they have never been taught that? And if that's the case, then I'm going to start at that first level, that pre pre primer, and I'm going to work through and I'm going to see what kind of interaction and what gauge I get um, and response. And if she's doing well, I'll just I would probably do a couple more to solidify that. And then I'd move up to the, the primer set and go from there. Awesome. Um, we have one more question. Do you have a good resource for real images? Do you have somewhere that, I mean, I, I know you can go on like, I don't know, we use Pixabay a fair amount because it's yeah, free, yeah. but do you have other so things? I do, I do have the, the Canva Pro subscription. So I use Canva um, to get images, um, but I'll also, if I'm in a pinch, I'll use Google images, just especially for like animals. I will like get a picture of a lion that way um, if I need to. What I like about Canva is like, you don't have to save everything in there. Like you can just go into your elements and you can pull something over. Um, so I can make that book. Remember we talked about engaging, right? I can make that book now, instead of it being um, a presentation, I can now swap out every animal and have the kid delete them. And now let's bring in the next animal and we're gonna bring it over from Canva. So I really like that for um, engaging. Um, the kids and giving them that control rather than just reading a book. Excellent. Okay, it looks like that may be all the questions that we have right now. Do you have anything you want to share to close out your session? Um, just that give them all the benefit of the doubt. They're going to surprise you with what they can do. I know that in <laughs> The, the short amount of time that I've been running this camp, they've surprised me beyond belief. Um, and we've got varying levels and varying diagnoses. And it's just, it's impressive what actual consistent literacy instruction can do for kids. I could not agree more. And not just with literacy, but with, with anything. all of it. You name it. Yeah, <laughs> yes. you name it. Anything. Anything. Excellent. So just try it. Trust me, they're going to blow you away. Thank you, Kristen. This has been an excellent session. I really appreciate the resources and things that you've shared. Sure. Um, and we appreciate you taking the time to come and share that. Thank you to those who have attended this session. I hope you've been able to pull something from this that you can use in your, your practice or your um, with your kiddos, whoever you're working with, and be able to move forward and, and take those next steps. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And we hope we'll see you in the next AAC in the Cloud session. Have a great day. Thank you.